Right. Everybody is energized, huh? That's great. It's my first talk. How? We just start talking. All right. That's good. That's even better. Yeah. So, hey, I'm in cloud computing for, you know, we are all in for the past, like, you know, seven, eight years. And uh, some of this, this talk came in from my pain points, like, hey, what are the design principles we need to really look after? So out of this talk, just to give you a good understanding what we are trying to do, uh, what you want to make sure is that at high level, you will understand why the design is important. Why I'm talking about design. That's the first thing. We look at why it is more important to design your software well. And there are a couple of series of my talks which are catered towards it. And uh, as some of the aspects I'm going to cover uh, uh, today. And then we'll look at some of the design uh, principles, look at some security aspects at the end. Uh, so that's pretty much it. So we got like uh, one hour, so let's get going. OK, so number one, if you go to any company, any product manager, what's the first thing they say? I want my perform, this one is uptime. Like, hey, I want to make sure I'm, my service is available for 99.999999% of the time. It's not possible, really. You know, if some product owner comes and tells you, hey, is, I want 99.99 uh, .99 availability, this is pretty tall order. What we are saying, five minutes of downtime. And that's one of the issues which we have got. So someone says 99.999, no company has got that. So, so if your product owner comes in and say, hey, this is what I'm going to build on, you might want to talk to them. Say, hey, industry standard, like 99.99 is the best you can go for here. And we'll look at that in more details. Another aspect you want to look at is the response time. 500 milliseconds, that's a pretty standard. Like in any, when you're building a REST API or building a response time, who wants to wait for more than three seconds for any site? I would not want to wait for more than three seconds. So 500 milliseconds for any web service response is pretty typical. You, you want to achieve that. Another thing is supportability. When I say supportability, that means, hey, you have got a transaction going on, which is asynchronous transaction, and that has, is going through many layers. What if something goes wrong? How are you going to debug that? How are you going to resolve the problem in five seconds? Is there a way to do that? So that's another question we're going to answer. Are you able to test your application? Yes, you can all write micro tests, which is a great thing to do. But is the micro test going to really suffice when you actually build the application live in production. And uh, that's where the QA in production is coming in. Nowadays, there are companies who are doing QA, quality assurance, as part of the production interface. And you want to build your application, which is design-wise, is not vendor lock-in. That means if you are working on Amazon, web services, and we had the same choice when we were working on our, our projects. Uh, we took the technologies which now we are able to go from Amazon to Google. And of course, that took like a month to go there, but there was no vendor lock-in. So when you evaluate, you want to make sure you, you, you look at that. Not only that, your application is not alone. You're working, you have some microservices which you are building. How many here are doing greenfield application? All right, so you are in this land, like La La Land, which is really awesome. You, you're gonna love this, this land. But the problem, what is the problem with this land? You still have to work with old applications. You cannot live alone. So you have some old applications running in this public cloud, and there is a private cloud too, guys. So when you think about public cloud, private cloud, and then your nice services, the microservices which you are going to build in, you're still going to face the security issues. You're still going to face, uh, fa face like, you know, uh, insecure network, uh, uh, net network connections. So those things you have to keep in mind while, while building the design, design for your application. And the important thing is resilience. No matter what happens, no matter what happens, the plant your application must, must still be able to survive, even if in the flood, it should, it should be surviving. So 
Think about it as like a, as, as the core principle you're going to build your software on. Now let's look at Uber. How many here go in Uber or Ola? You know, those are the two ones which uh, I have used here. So Uber, what happens is that they've started with the same thing. They had a concept of like, you know, two applications were there, like, you know, they were kind of two trunks. It's kind of monolithic app they were building. And uh, when we start working on, most of us are facing the same problem. We have a monolithic app, we have to convert into cloud. Yes? Say yes. That's what the same problem we all face. So in that monolithic app, everything is present, like, you know, users, trips, payment, documents, they, something light bulb hit, hit their mind to Uber. It said, hey, maybe when I'm doing a document or maybe I'm doing the, the uh, you know, background checks or some of these things can be done separately. Payments can be done separately. So that's what they devised. What they did was initial design was like real-time services are calling the back end. Uh, so trips cost around 60% of the time. So what's the first thing we need to do? We need to analyze from the Uber perspective what's the business model looks like. And why I'm talking about the business model because when you understand the business model and then you can compare with your business model and then see that, hey, what are the things which you need to have in place. So let's talk about this for a second. So you're going to have, first of all, anyone who wants to get a ride, what do they do? Say, hey, I want to go from here um, I want to go to another part of the city and then say boom, boom, boom. And then what happens after that? The, that text is being sent and the drivers are being notified. Five or six drivers are notified. And out of those five or six drivers, now you have to, they, they have to sign up. Yes, I, I want this, uh, this ride to be taken. Based on that ride, you, they come to our, our, ours and, and work on it. Now you think about it for a second. What are the failure points? When you think about failure points, your application all have failure points. Think about it. Your application, when you're, when you're building an application, do not think that there is no failure for, 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 for your application. That means they identified the failure points. What is the first failure point they may have? Huh? Network problem could be there. Customer might be delayed. Yeah, what happens when, the, when the, we call for the Uber and then we, they are waiting for half an hour? It's, it's cutting down their cost, you know, they have to prevent that. So those are the things you have to prevent. So what do they do? They created web services based on that to notify you that, hey, two, two minutes before the Uber, Uber driver arrives, what do they do? They send a text message to you, hey, Uber driver is arriving, be ready. And then they send another message, like right outside, he's outside, he would wait for two minutes. After that, what happens? The charge starts, you know? So all those things, you have to build those as part of your application, um, uh, application flow as, as a whole. And of course, you have to do the payment, and payment processing is complicated too, in, in, in this case. And you can have thousands of these services which, which are built on top of it. Now, what do they do it was, they build the microservice architecture. And based on that architecture, they were able to perform these operations. So we will talk about some of those technologies they used as part of, uh, part of my talk, um, talk here. So there, they want to make sure 99.9% .9 availability. That's what one of their uh, cost thing is. Minimal operational cost per trip. So when they are making a trip, they can have a shared ride. Or they, or they want to make sure you're going from one place to another place, they take less amount of time to do that. So that's another thing which you can, which you can build into. And of course, there another one is uh, 500 millisecond response time. That's, those are the three things, three criteria. You come up with a domain model. Domain model remains the same, guys. So, I mean, you might have a credit account, a rider and driver is there. Hey, driver has ratings as well as the customer has ratings. So customer, if the customer has a poor rating, and there was one lady in New York, uh, she's saying, nobody's coming and picking me up. And someone told her, hey, you have bad ratings. So that's pretty common, like, you know, um, um, uh, as, uh, as we look at this. So the whole thing is that your application, platform as a service, whichever you're building in a private cloud or in the microservices, they all have to connect with each other. 
that's the that's the key part uh, uh, key part here um, okay so what's the first thing first the design principle first number one design principle is everything must go through api gateway okay api as a product okay this is the term search on the google you will find more details on that uh, api as a product is coming as a new design principle for anything you're building so what that means in our application also uh, we have a very nice ui but we have a very big customer and who would not want to use our ui and what they have they have their own ui built in so what we want to make sure that any response request coming in either from the model view controller perspective uh, it comes through the single point of api gateway all the rest services are coming all coming through this those two are the key design principle uh, you want you want to understand now api exposed so apis can be exposed as part of the layer itself so first layer can be and and i have a separate talk i'll go in much more detail in api so i probably won't spend more time here but uh, um, but you expose some of the APIs. Based on these APIs, you create business APIs. And those are the APIs which are consumed by, let's say, a customer, uh, which is consumed by your partners. Okay? So you don't think that you are alone. You might be interfacing with what? SAP. All right? You might be interfacing with SAP, with PeopleSoft, or you know, other software, Oracle Financials, you might be interfacing with them. So don't think that you're alone. So those are the business app experiences. And based on that, you have experience API, which is the API on top of it. Make sense? So you have to look at, look at, uh, look at, look at from the perspective of the API design, how you're going to do the design part here. And we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later in a separate talk. So hey, you got the power. You got real power, but with, with the power comes responsibility, yes? You got, you got to save the city. You have to make sure, hey, we, we are able to still deliver to the customer at the end. Twitter. Think about Twitter. Hmm. They are down. Of course, you should be graceful. Like, that's another design principle which you have to understand that you will, your application will fail. It's not like it, it whether it will fail or not, it will fail. What you do if it fails? That's the key. That's the key we are trying to ask here. So scalability is also a challenge. When you want to scale your application, how are you going to scale? Are you going to start with Twitter has few followers, but how about you have like 100,000 followers? How are you going to scale uh, that, that big? And what technologies they use? We're going to discuss some of those technologies, you know, right after, uh, after this. So traditional approaches, you put a HA proxy. Put one more HA proxy, put one more HA proxy. That might not be the best solution because you are just uh, trying to cater to the biggest load and then working, working on top of it, okay? So what, you, what do we need to do in that case? Uh, Three-tier applications, we all building three-tier applications. Like, you know, you have a client layer, middle layer is there and data layer is there, like, and the resources. That's, we all are trained in like from past 10 years, we are all building, we are all pro at it. Uh, you might have multi-layered application also, where your presentation layer is calling the application layer, which is, which is calling the fixed data, which is coming at the end. That's where it comes Dockers. So Dockers is a, is, is a technology, I mean, how many here have used Docker? So I wouldn't want to bore you into this uh, Docker land, but the whole idea behind it is that you want to make sure, even if you have an application which is not, uh, which is still monolithic, you can still put it as part of Docker image. There's no problem doing that, uh, that thing to start with. But the whole idea is putting in the, as a container, you should be able to spawn and be able to do the configuration management really fast. So you should be able to deploy a Docker image and remove the Docker image in split seconds. So those things are uh, very much, very much a possibility here. And we'll talk about some of these tools um, as we go along. So what does Docker really provides us? It provides us different layers. So you know, anybody eat um, has a, eaten a, a burger, like you know, where they have different layers. Think about this as a kernel. Based on the kernel, you might have an image, which is like a Dublin or some image is there. 
on top of it you can put your own application these are your application you are putting on top of it the advantage here is that if one of the version changes of one of the application changes you just have to redeploy the docker file and it will be able to okay the new version for apache has come in you just need to change that so what do you need to test only apache earlier what you need to test the whole thing you have to test so that was the problem um, in in the earlier model as a whole so so um, uh, as part of so so docker has like you know different ways of uh, connecting So Docker has something called Docker Hub. So you can log into Docker Hub to find out and explore what are the different images which are available. As you can see, you know, there are lots of images available to you. Not only that, uh, how many here have worked on GitHub? Like, you know, it, how easy it is to deploy an application and run it. It's not that easy. Even if you want to understand an application, it's not that easy. So if you have an image already running a running app, you should be able to directly go in and you know, hey, say, okay, I want to try out Redis. You click on Redis and you can try out Redis from, from here. You know, different applications you can try. Um, try from here. Um, so what all what all are the things you can do? So what you can do is like you know you can you can basically uh, find out like you know hey uh, as a Docker you can install a Kitematic. So Kitematic is one of the tools like you know uh, which has been given. You can install the Kitematic and you know using CLI. I'm just logging it uh, to Docker CLI and then you know I can say Docker Docker PS. It'll tell me like what are the different uh, applications which are running right now. Um, uh, uh, for for my here uh, in this application, Docker images. So I got like only one uh, application running, which is a killer weather application. Uh, so if I want to download an application, I can uh, you know um, I can I can download an application too um, as as part of my usage. So if I need to find out. Uh, uh, if I have a Redis application running somewhere, and any application which has a three star you want to get, so it got me uh, the first one which has the most stars, um, and then probably I want to I want to run with this Redis application, so I can say So you, you can actually play along, uh, along with this, but I, what I wanted to show you was that, you know, it's pretty easy to connect and, and, and start using them. If I had more time, I could have, I could have gone in detail about, about this. And this is, in this example, what I'm doing is I'm creating a two-node cluster for Cassandra. Uh, the first node cluster, I, I'm, I'm trying to create N1 as the name for the Cassandra. So it will pull the Cassandra image. From, uh, from Docker Hub, and basically um, I can create a two node cluster and find out the node tool status out of it. It's pretty easy to uh, do it. If I get time at the end, I promise what I'll do is I'll come back to this and you know, we can go over uh, in more, more detail um, about this one. So what's really happening from the design perspective, as this is part of the design, what's happening is the SQL databases, we are moving from SQL database towards Big data, no SQL database. We all agree? Because now the data as, as a whole is Internet of Things. Your data is not just uh, at one place. You can get the data from the weather. You can get the data from point of sales. How your customer is behaving, depending upon that, you can target the products for them. Make sense? Uh, similarly, I already talked about the API. API as a platform. This has been adapted um, as a whole. So. And then all your application must also work in smartphones. Those are the three design, design things which you want to uh, make sure you have in place. So let's look at some of the principles which are, which are behind, behind this. 
So number one is resiliency. That's, that's the number one principle. You want to make sure your application fail as soon as possible. You know, as part of your test, you should shut down your application. It should still work. That's, that's the whole idea behind it. You want to make sure that if it, if it can happen in any ways, it, it can be a hardware failure, it can be a network failure, um, but if, if it happens, then the application must work. Even with downgraded performance, it's perfectly fine, but the application has to, has to perform, perform well. Uh, another thing is loosely coupled. So when you're building your components, you know, you should be able to make sure your components are created, and that this is important from the design perspective also. If you have different applications within your, uh, within, within your network, they should be, you should build your swim lanes. Uh, you know, uh, uh, swimming pool, like we all go, and you know, there are swim lanes. When you're swimming, you're gonna swim in that lane only. You're not gonna go to another lane and start swimming there. That's pretty clear because what's happening is when a request has been sent, it's, it will go through only that swim lane till the end. You do not go to another vertical application and call them. That makes it as a spaghetti, a, um, spaghetti code for yourself. So manage for the failure and latency. So that's the, that's the key part here, um, which, which we need to build. Uh, what if the critical data is not written to the database? What do you do? You want to make sure that you store it offline. Offline syncing, you have to make sure that there is a syncing process also in place. So all these are design things like, you don't want to just say that, hey, my application only works when there is internet. <laughs> Probably not a good idea. Like, you know, uh, for example, I'm using, you know, Fitbit right now. If I'm making some steps, and if I'm not connected to my phone, it should still track it because I will be mad like, hey, I'm losing my steps. You know, <laughs> I have to make 10,000 steps a day, but if I'm not able to do that, if it's sync, then it will do it. No, 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 it's, you should have a, a strategy to save, your, uh, save, save, the, save the data. So another important thing is when you are living, when you are in your one occupant, that was perfectly fine. That's a single tenancy model. But when it comes to multi-tenancy, that means you might have noisy neighbor, yeah? You might have a noisy neighbor, you have to make sure that you build your application so that you, 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 uh, you take into account if there is any noisy neighbors. So that's, you have, to, uh, you have to understand that aspect. So infrastructure failures, like you know, a lot of uh, DOS attacks, you know, denial of service attacks can be there. Um, uh, and which can cause delays. So what do we do in this case? So there are, there are one design principle here is that when you're sending the task, whenever something is coming in, you send it through a message queue. And this pattern is very much used a lot. And I'll talk about few of these uh, technologies you know, in, in my uh, later talks, but this gives a good understanding. So how many of you drive MQ or uh, you know, uh, uh, active MQ? Everyone pretty much use that uh, right now. So, but the problem is that RabbitMQ and ActiveMQ, they solve some purpose, but after some time, like because these did this, if, if, if you are monitoring a lot of data, they might not be able to uh, process them faster. So what do you do if something goes wrong? You retry after some time. Okay, this fails, this fails. You retry, th third time it passes. And then because that's the model, you want to make sure your application still works. That's the key, yes? So that's the part which you want to make sure uh, you do that. That's where Twitter comes in. We talked about, we talked about this um, uh, in this case. Another problem is latency. If you want to go, I just make a round trip. And I'm not talking round trip by a plane. I'm talking by a wire going through it costs 70 milliseconds. So if you are going from New York to San Francisco, if you have two services in two different locations, probably not a good idea. If they're calling it, you know, a lot of times. So what do you need to do? Co-locate them. Exactly. That's one of the design principles. Like, you know, a lot of companies have faced this problem that, you know, hey, our application works fine, uh, but uh, when we deploy it, it doesn't work. 
because it's calling a different location, which is not a, not, not a good way of doing that. And service, and that's another problem which is there. We have all these services intertwined, dependent on each other. So uh, it, this has been solved, by the way, by you know, technologies like you know, Kubernetes, you know, other technologies that which, which actually solve this really well, um, and create a container which is scalable, but all the services are within that itself. So that's a good, uh, good way of dealing with that. So you co-locate. That's number one solution. Yes, we talked about this. And reduce the number of network requests. So why do you need to make calls? I know three or four projects which has failed miserably just because of this reason. HTML5 and you know, and then you can do a loop back and which can call uh, back end. But you don't want to call it uh, a lot of times. Yes, the technology is there to make AJAX calls or you know, there are other technologies uh, which, which are available. You do not want to do that. Because with 100 concurrent users, your application will fail. So that's, that's, the, that's the problem uh, which, which is there. So this is a 2009 model. This is the bandwidth, so Netflix. You know, Netflix, I think they are coming in India too, sometime? Huh? They're already here, yes, that's good. So, uh, so they, in 2010, 9-10 time frame, when they send one request, there was 13 requests were sent and before they get the value. Is that a good thing? No. So what they did was they reduced. They reduced the number of calls. So nine calls are collapsed into one. That's what you need to do from the design principle perspective. And you may ask me a question, hey, so that means that I don't need to build microservices behind the scenes. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that behind the scene, you want to make sure that you have all these, uh, all these uh, connections. All these microservices are all called from behind the scene. And you get a collection of the REST API and then return it back. And just return the thing which you really need. That's another design principle which is there, which is like from the design perspective, if your API, if you're building an API and, and you have three components, customer, order, shipments and if the and the person is not interested in shipment they say i am interested in customer and order and it will only return that same same api it's the same api the name is still the same but it's going to return only those two values make sense so that's the key uh, uh, to make sure you have a good design in place another principle which is a problem basically is a secure so when you say secure that means you don't have, this is the KPMG life cycle, which is there. When, when the data is generated, it should be secure. When you use it or transform the data or store it or destruct it, in every way there is a compliance. And of course, there are you know, three major compliances are there, which we all know, like you know, HIPAA compliance, you know, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley compliant. What else? Huh? Yeah? PCI is a standard, yeah, which is there, and PIBDA. PIBDA is from, uh, 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 from Canada, and European Union. Those are the four main ones which we need to think about when we are, when we are dealing with this. So data, when you are putting in a cell phone, is not secure. So you, have to, you want to make sure you have a secure connection. Um, of course, I mean, you want to make sure it's secure by, there are a lot of ways to secure it. Um, I have a separate talk on, like, security in much more detail, I can go over that. Uh, or you use a ping identity. Use some other way of connecting it. Now, thread modeling. So, I'll just show you quickly. So, from threat modeling perspective, are you guys able to see? Yeah. So, what's really happening is that I have an external user which is calling through, through a connection here, WAF, like, you know, it, it's a... It's a connection and it's HTTPS, which is really good. And I'm calling my trading application and it's going to SQL Server database. And there's a Cassandra database here. Okay? So, uh, but you know what? There's Magninot line. How many here know about the Magninot line? So what happened was that when we, in Europe, when, we, when they were building the, the, from Germany, they want to protect themselves. Like, you know, uh, you know France didn't want it to, uh, to have uh, Germany attack them again. So they created a very good defense 
wherever they were, they were part of Germany. But they did not took any defense from the other side. You know, there are other countries they were interfacing with them. They didn't do any defense from there. That's exactly the same thing. If you see this here, I have web application directly calling my trading app. Hmm, there's something wrong. So maybe what I can do is I can let let's just search for this. Web application. Okay. So the number one problem which I could face here is input validation. Uh, lack of input validation is there. Cross site forgery, uh, you know, CSRF, which can which can take place. Um, Elevation of using impersonation, that's a high, like, you know, this is a really big problem which could be there. So what I'm showing you right now is a very easy way to find out what are the problems you could face, okay? So how are you going to do this? The, in Microsoft, there's a tool called Threat Modeling Tool. You can download it, download that tool, and build your company profile, something similar to this. And, and basically, it will tell you like what are the areas which might have problems, okay? Which is a good way of uh, you know uh, uh, fixing fixing those problems. Make sense? Yep. Okay. And then what it does is that at the end uh, in in the tool itself, it actually gives you a nice UI. And you can say that, hey, this access, external access is mitigated. You have mitigated this access, uh, data flow sniffing attack, which is going to happen, will not happen. OK? So that's the key for, for, for any cloud application you want, you want to build, build your application. Uh, now, data can be in use, like you, know, you want to put it in the database, or in motion, or at rest. All three areas, it should be protected. That's the key part here from the design perspective. Now, another important principle is location independence. When I say location independent, what means that whenever I have one application running here, the third fish comes here. I should be able to move from this box to this box. That's the key part here. That means I should be scalable. You cannot have uh, configuration endpoint addresses. So you can't say, hey, I want to use this endpoint. So you can't say no hard hard-coded endpoints you can use. How many here use hard-coded endpoints? Or we have used it in the past. So, <laughs> so which we should avoid. Like if you see that, hey, you have a hard-coded endpoint you're using, you might want to change that. So, so it's not the right way to do that. So what is the best way to do it? One principle is using ZooKeeper. So from ZooKeeper perspective, any of your service, whichever the, uh, you know, from the a API server is there and web server is there, so from ZooKeeper, it publishes there. And you register all your services to the ZooKeeper. You might have 20 services for, for each one of them, two or three services. ZooKeeper will keep track of your services. OK? That's the key part here. You would not want to use uh, you know, only one service to use it. And this is another example from Miso's perspective. Like Marathon, it, it basically, so from the client perspective, clients send the request out as a task to Marathon. So Marathon then processes that task, it launches that task to Miso's master, uh, which basically sends it to the slaves. Uh, you, it might have like two or three slaves to perform that operation. But what is the key part here? What's the best part here? Miso's has been used by you know, um, Apple. They were not scalable. That's Siri, when they came up with Siri, um, uh, the, the application, you know, they could not perform that well. Uh, they were using Cassandra, by the way. They were using good technologies, but they were not able to scale that well. So they had to move towards a new technology, uh, and then uh, and they used uh, BSOS for that purpose, which is really good uh, way to connect it. And of course, uh, so that's that's one model which you can use along with ZooKeeper. So what we discussed before. Zookeeper, where you're accessing all the services. So what it means, all my services, if one service goes down, Zookeeper will send it to another service. So it will keep a pool of three or four services, like, you know, get me, uh, get me orders for this customer. You're building that service. It will keep the pool of those services. Okay? 
Yes. Yeah. It does. It does only keep the servicing, only the service registry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we'll talk about other technologies which you can use on top of it to do other things. Yeah. So another is component should be stateless. So when you are building your application, REST APIs must be stateless. You know, all the components must be stateless. Like you know, and in case of Kubernetes, like you know, all this they build their application based on stateless applications. That's the key part uh, for this one is. Um, and you should use established, uh, you know, protocols and uh, HTTPS, Docker's. Whichever is adapted as a technology, you can use it. But if it is not adapted, you know, it's, uh, no point in using that technology. Um, API management through proxy. So what does it really mean is that whenever we building our application, you are building a sandbox application. Like you know, you are saying, okay, I build this API, but based on this API, you create a proxy here. Based on the proxy, then you have other people use that particular proxy. What it really means, and I'll talk about more in my other, uh, other talk, is you come up with your ideal design. That means you make sure that your design from, from the get-go, how the customers is going to use this, that has to be correct first. That, mean, that has to be what? What are the parameters? Anybody? Parameters? Number one? 99.99% availability. What else? Response time of? Less than 500 milliseconds. Well, we say, I say to my team, 250 milliseconds. Because what happens when, they, when we get this output, then the UI has to work too on top of it. So we are looking at 250 milliseconds, just an FYI. Internally, we do that so that we can track of like where, where are the issues coming in. Those two principles applied with this one come up with ideal design. Based on that ideal design, now you build your application, build a proxy layer here. When you build a proxy layer, what is the benefit of that? Security is one, yeah? What else? Huh? Yeah, that, that's a good point. Like you can have a security, uh, can be there. What else, can, what else is a really big benefit of proxy? Caching. You can use your old application. You have a fat application used somewhere, like you know, you can't change a whole monolithic app into a new app. You have to start from somewhere, you know, but don't, but still come up with ideal design. That's what I'm trying to say here. Come up with ideal design, how are you going to use this particular service? And of course, we talked about API gateway, uh, you know, how to do that. Another part is scalability, where you want to make sure that with demand, if, uh, the capacity, uh, you know, it increases. That's, that's the key part which I'm trying to say here um, in, in this case. Um, and uh, as, so, so when you are saying composing different, different components, so you, you should be able to build on top of different co-located components. That's what you are uh, saying in this case. From manageability perspective, important thing is uh, troubleshooting and recovery. You should be able to recover. Uh, what it means that SOC 2 compliant, how many here have to do SOC 2 compliant? I think if you are in cloud, you have to do that. So whenever somebody says that I need to interface with another application, which is not in your realm, what you need to ask, how, what is your data loss strategy? Ask that question. It's a very good question to ask. What is your data loss strategy? What it means that, what if, hey, you send the data to them but their server crashed. They acknowledge, yes, everything worked, but they lost that data. You should be able to resend that same data out to them from the delta, what has changed in past eight hours. You should be able to resend that same data out. It's not network was bad, no. The whole cluster went down. That whole thing went down and they lost their data. Amazon did that, does that where one, one zone goes down, another zone picks it up in eight hours. So you lose eight hours of data. Amazon still say you lose it. So you have to be prepared. To, so you create the REST APIs or, or some services to support that. Make sense? Yeah? 
All right. So um, I think other things we talked about it already. So we should be good. Yeah, and you should have some way of like monitoring them, you know, um, as a whole. There are a lot of monitoring tools available uh, which you can use for this purpose. Infrastructure independence. So that means lock-in, we talked about it. Vendor lock-in, you should not do. And uh, consumption aware. It does cost money. So you do not think that it does not cost money. So you have an app server, you have a DB server, and your running, running cost is $600. $632 per year. Expensive. One server is costing this much amount, like your application is costing this much amount of money. But now what's happening? There is a other thing coming in serverless architectures. I think we'll come to it in five minutes, but you have the code, you inject that code wherever you need it. So that's the key part um, of, of the serverless architecture model. Uh, minimize the transport costs, like provide the APIs which returns the partial response. So this is the key part here, guys. You don't need to send everything. You send only the things which you really need. Make sense? And if the customer, let's say you have an order object. Order object is huge. It starts from here, it goes till here. And the customer is only interested in how many orders at a high level, how much money I spend. Should you send the whole object? No. That's where you can use partial items and I'll talk about in API you know design uh, design how do we do that partial items uh, in, in this case same thing is true with the data compression you should compress the data and then send the data out um, so another thing is that I think we talked about uh, the immutable objects Netflix so Netflix is a case study how many years here you, have been, you guys are using Netflix here what it is providing is a streaming API. At the end of the day, you're watching a movie, and if this goes down, it's perfectly fine. It'll go to another, another box, and these are Cassandra nodes, which are there. Because it can go to another node, and you can still watch that movie, what does it give it? Highly available. So you're becoming highly available, and you're getting response time of less than 500 milliseconds using, using these two models um, and as a whole. And you have to build all your infrastructure based on the same technology, like you know, using the Zookeeper and with you know, web, web services model. And component service is also the same thing. Like if one service goes down, another service should kick in uh, based on that. Another thing is testability I talked about you, to you before. What it means that you have a chaos gorilla you know, they have come up with a term called chaos gorilla. What it means that you want to make sure that you bring down your nodes. So what they do is they bring down the whole zone and transfer into another zone and still you will be able to watch the movies. This is called QA in production. And this is a very easy way to do that. You find out the time and the place or the area of users and profile them who are using like North Dakota, only five users are using the movie. Test it out at that time. That's, that's one way of like, you know, testing out some of these things. And that's the easier way of controlling it. Last year, all of these services were down. CNN was down, you know, Microsoft was down. Only people were able to watch Netflix from US. So that was, that's, hey, there was, must be something uh, uh, good how they are testing it out. And, okay, so cloud design principles. So let's talk about the cloud design principles quickly. So one is a circuit breaker. How many here know about circuit breaker pattern? Okay, so what it really provides you is an ability from, uh, from uh, if one, uh, one circuit breaks, you fail fast. Fail fast means you move on to another service till that service comes back on. Um, this is a key, key way of making it faster response time. You would not want, wait, want to wait for the service. You, how many times you can retry? You know? So this pattern is being adapted by you know, Netflix and it's now been adapted by everybody um, uh, who are using it. So fallback, uh, fallback strategy is really good. Uh, uh, you know, where either you can fail transparently or fail, uh, fail 
silently without telling them, hey, something went wrong. <clears throat> so what it provides you is something, kind of a graph, something like this. You, what you're saying is that the service was down 90, 84 times. The service was actually wrong. And you, you can just see it here that, oh, it was down uh, when there was a peak load coming in. So what happens? The system administrator, they are looking at this dashboard where they're going to say, that, oh, you know what, this service, 58 times blocked. Maybe there is something wrong here. But what, they are doing it on Monday. They're not doing it on the weekend. Nobody is making them a call, the site is down. That's the key part here. Resiliency comes in with, with this circuit breaker pattern um, as, as his, uh, we are using, hysterics we are using here. Okay? So that's the key part. And request queuing pattern. So uh, we got another 10 minutes to go. So what I will do, I'll try to do as much, you know, hey, and, uh, you know, and if I'll probably keep like a few minutes at the end for question and answers. Um, and uh, so we can go from there. So request queuing pattern where all the requests are queued. Uh, and then, then you send across from, from the tasks which are need to be performed to the services. This is the key for big data. Okay? With, and, and RavidMQ uses this. And, you know, uh, are there other patterns which are using this one. So what happens is that when there is a producer, producer is there, you send it through the topic, and then how many queues you are creating. What you are doing is that if you have a highly available customer, you want to give a SLA, better SLA for some customers, what do you do? Make them, from the producer, it goes to the green queue, and it will process that faster for them, because you have a higher SLA for them. Uh, and for example, red fast. So you know, there's another one, like another customer which is there. And of course, uh, so you can create three different queues and solve that, solve that kind of problem, like you know, which comes in uh, with the customer. Uh, request queuing pattern has benefit because it improved fault tolerance. But you know, you have to make sure that you know you build your application, you know, you, using this particular model. Another model is request collapsing model. Request collapsing model means that you have an API request coming out from here, and, and uh, when you submit it, you add that to a queue, and you micro-batch it. You're sending a micro-batch from here. This has been used by, by a lot of products right now. You know, Kafka uses this, um, you know, uh, Eka uses this, and you know, that's the pattern being used Kind of, uh, and uh, Spark uses this also as a micro, uh, micro batch from this for streaming purpose, D streams. So what's really happening is from the Spark streaming perspective, you, uh, from the Kafka, you are getting the input. Input can be from the transaction, input, input can be from a cell phone, or input can be from a weather channel, which is coming through, um, or Twitter, Twitter feed. You send that as an input, uh, as a uh, Spark streaming, you create resilient data uh, RDD graphs, and basically you process them in a discrete streams. Make sense? This way, you are able to process them faster. What does that mean? That you're not sending them right away. What the queue does, a RabbitMQ does, what does it do? It sends it right away. When some request is coming, you process it right away. Here it's collecting them and then sending them. That's the key part. That design pattern is pretty much uh, very well used right now. Another one is object uh, change notification pattern, where, hey, you have an observer pattern here, and you're observing a, uh, uh, a particular subject which is being given to you. When you use observer pattern, that means you can add another pattern. If, if another, another person comes in who needs, who needs to notify, be notified, they're going to create a notify pattern for as an observer pattern for this one. This is another big pattern used. Um, okay. So service discovery, I think we talked about it. So that's, that's, the, that's the Eureka client. When, 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 when we are calling, so Netflix Eureka has a Eureka client. Which can, which can call a Eureka server. And basically what it does is it, it basically gets the requests um, uh, for that particular registry. And this is used 
to get the get client side load balancing. You know, when you want to do client side load balancing, client already knows whom I'm dealing with in the back end, so you can use this uh, particular pattern uh, to do that. Okay, now there is something called serverless. Uh, serverless architectures are coming in. So when I say serverless architecture, what does it really mean? It means that whenever this client makes some changes, so authentication service comes in, uh, or uh, uh, client is making some changes, all these areas which are there, they are independent of each other. That means you are doing event sourcing. The concept of event sourcing is that you are sourcing the data. Something changed in the transactional database. So this is a transactional database. Something changes here. Based on something changes here, you can send an event, which is called event-driven architecture. You send an event through Spark to either Cassandra or NoSQL databases. Okay, so that's that's pretty pretty good way of doing that. So when I am writing a code for this one, this is a snippet of code which is written. So which means that whenever that trigger took place, you don't have any server. You don't have any server running. But you have whenever there is an event, event processing for that server takes place. The advantage for this approach is now you're not paying for the server. You're only paying for the processing. So whenever, so whenever you have from AWS, uh, Lambda is uh, using the same concept where there is a mobile app changes are there or uh, some services changes are there. When they take place, you only pay for whenever the script runs. Pretty cool. So you only, you're not paying for the server at all. So this makes it like really, uh, you know, uh, easier for you to deal with um, your application. How many here deals with the, you know, tracing? What happens if there is a, uh, a transaction? Normally we have one transaction, yeah? We have one database, we have got one transaction. What happens if there is a distributed transaction is going on? Client is sending a request through the load balancer, it first going to authentication, response is coming back, then going to billing, and some changes are done in billing, and then resource API is being called, and then, of course, at the end, the client is getting the request back up. So the key part of this design is that you should be able to track a transaction which is beyond the boundaries of a particular transaction you're dealing with. Make sense? You should be able to trace back. That comes back to supportability. Make sense? So you want to be able to say, hey, something went wrong. Where did it go wrong? You should be able to find out that information, say, oh, you know what, it failed in this area. Resource allocation and provisioning, it failed. Or storage allocation, it failed. But this is the whole transaction. The client end-to-end -end transaction is going on. That's the, that's the model uh, which, is, which is coming from the, from the open tracing. So you can uh, understand, try to, uh, try to understand that model. So another one is uh, AWS device form, where I uh, won't go in detail, but what it provides you is Automated testing, so you once you once you deploy your application, it will um, it, it will parallelly test on all the devices as a device form. Like your application works in all of them, or you can do the remote access through a PC and be able to run run your application through a web browser for all all the devices which are given to you. So that's another thing which is coming up right now um, as a pretty good pretty good industry. Um, I'll, we got like five minutes left, so what I'll do is, uh, you know, I'll just touch on the concept of microservices, but I think we are all, how many here are using microservices? So I wouldn't want to uh, bore you with this, but the whole idea here is that you want to make sure Uh, you want to make sure that the microservices are like you know um, uh, um, are, are are done are done correctly uh, for 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 the purpose. So and the last part, which is there, is 12-factor application. So the 12-factor app is another thing. I will at the end. This is where I'm going to stop. So you want to look at all of them and find out like go to Google it 12-factor app and you should be able to look at these design principles. Thanks all for coming. I'm uh, available for any questions 
um, and later on also. Thank you. Thank you.